Hello everyone, today I'm at Fort 7 in Poznan, Poland and this is a military fort which was built by the Germans in the 1880s and at the time it was built this part of Poland was actually a part of Germany and then Germany would go on to lose most of its Polish territories along with this fort following the First World War. And then during the Second World War, Germany invaded Poland once again, and they regained use of this fort, and they turned it from a military fort into Poland's first concentration camp, which opened in October of 1939. And uh, this is a pretty large fort. It has all these tunnels and some of them are closed off to the public and then some are open and all these uh, different passages and stairways. It really is a uh, pretty large maze once you get inside of here. And um, anyhow, so the Germans operated this as a concentration camp and the first people to meet their fate here were nearby patients from psychiatric hospitals and uh, basically what the Germans did is they just brought the hospital patients here and they gassed them. So it was used as a execution camp for psychiatric hospital patients and then later on in the war the Germans used it just as a, a general prison for almost anyone that they did not like and that list is pretty long um, it's estimated that between 4500 to 20,000 people were killed here at Fort 7 and it's just an estimate because they don't really have good um, ongoing records of what was happening here at the time but the the overall figures are at least in the, the uh, thousands of people died here and uh, then approximately one year before the end of the war the Germans converted this into a telecommunications factory to build radios for aircraft and submarines and uh, they probably did that to I think for two reasons probably to try to get rid of the evidence of what they did here that's probably the primary reason and maybe the secondary reason might have been this was a really safe location for a building that's about 140 years old it's it's very well built and um, it has all these different rooms and uh, different cells and each one kind of has their own story and this is cell number 64 and this cell at one time held approximately 60 people and some even held a lot more than that. Some held over a hundred. So just try to picture 60 people in this, this one rather small room. Cell number 64. We stopped in front of cell number 64. The officer illuminated it and opened the door. The prisoners in the cell awoke and stood at attention in two lines. And the chief of staff gave his report. After about an hour, I heard footsteps approaching our cell. For a moment, I thought they were coming for me. Colleagues who were also awake started to raise their heads and as if they were getting ready to jump. They were waiting for the door to open. Then the door opened and about 60 prisoners, including them and I, jumped to our feet, forming two lines at the command and we turned our eyes toward the door. I was standing at the end of the front row and noticed 
the non-commissioned officer I have seen in the office during the interrogation, three high police officers and one civilian. And now an incredible spectacle began. Policemen and civilians began to torture these people mercilessly. They beat them with thick sticks, iron rods, guard keys, and when they broke the sticks, they grabbed bulls, buckets, and one of them grabbed my shoes and beat the unfortunates on the head with its heels, so that in the morning I found them completely covered with blood. People fell to the floor, but got up so as not to be crushed by heavy boots. The massacre lasted for about 10 minutes, and I was surprised that no one was killed. Their appearance, however, was deplorable. Broken heads, noses, black eyes, torn arms and legs, they bled in blood. Some were missing teeth. And some of these cells are apparently still locked up and closed off. Like this one here, it says cell 63. And, but they do have these um, accounts of the prisoners. And this is the account of Alfred Pawlak imprisoned in the camp in Fort Seven from June to October 1940. The 2nd SS man quickly opened the door to the cell located just past the crossroads to the left and on the left side of this corridor, also about 50 meters long, the end of which overlooked a free space shining since the morning. As we entered, one of the men in it, standing in two lines, exclaimed, Attention, I am reporting obediently. The SS man key keeper interrupted him with the words, plus two men. I also heard, after a while, my eyes got used to the prevailing semi-darkness, and I was surprised to recognize at once a few of our colleagues from the military conspiracy and the WOZZ underground. As we were leaving the cell in twos, I noticed that the brick walls were completely wet. There were also large pools of water on the floor and two dark persons were squatting in one corner. And next is cell number 65. And though this one does look a little bit bigger, that could be because it doesn't have the chairs and the uh, exhibits and TV inside of it. And you should also keep in mind that a lot of these cells housed more than 50, 60 people. Some had upwards of 100 people. So that must have been extremely unbearable for the few people that uh, survived this ordeal. Cell number 65, the account of Casimir Cope imprisoned in Fort Seven from January to June 1941. I spent the first night curled up in a corner, sore after the interrogation. I used a thin layer of chaff sprinkled directly on the concrete as bedding and my own coat as a duvet. If I fell asleep, it was only for a moment. All the time I was thinking about what awaits me in the near future. The fellow prisoners were asleep, although their sleep could not be called restful. They were constantly tossing and turning from the cold, the tingling, and the biting of bugs of all kinds that were plentiful here. And then the next cell has a lot of uh, prisoner uh, artifacts and m memorabilia. And this is cell number 66. And this first exhibit has that stick there. It's labeled as a Gestapo squirt used for torturing prisoners. And then that chain with a lock says a chain which, according to testimonies, was used to tie prisoners during transit. And then this next exhibit has um, multiple death certificates of 
prisoners at Fort 7 and it is rather surprising that they even would have death certificates being that this whole um, prison operation was of course a war crime it, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense to have uh, death certificates if it's a criminal operation and then this next exhibit has some of the um, quilts and rosary which were made by prisoners and next this is some of the postcards from the prisoners so apparently a few people were able to send out postcards and then there is some sort of a indictment which is stamped 1942 so that must have been by the Germans most likely and this other case has more postcards and also photographs likely of the people who would later become prisoners here which included basically everyone from doctors, lawyers, business people and next um, similar as the previous case photographs of various prisoners and a postcard which was sent from Fort 7 and also a death certificate there and more prisoner postcards and prisoner photographs and then they have this viewing area here with the uh, film being played and sounds like everything is in Polish and that's a rather interesting I don't know if that's part of the art exhibit or if it's just a old blanket sitting down there and then on this other side there's more exhibits these are more prisoner photographs and that person is a photograph of Dr. Rydelski and this is a photograph of a lawyer and a professor and his name is Ron Ronald Pakwalski and more prisoner postcards and here's some um, utensils the prisoners used uh, large spoons and forks and also a shaving razor and then a bar of soap and that says it's a clay bar of soap and more quilts and rosaries knickknacks that were made by some of the prisoners here and these are portraits of some of the prisoners and here are some more postcards from Fort 7 can't really see the date on these but let's see photograph of blessed father Ludwig Mizik and then these are some of the German military orders of the time that established Fort 7 as a concentration camp and here's some pictures of the time those look to be German soldiers and then the caption is in Polish And here's some more prisoner cells. 
and this is cell number 70. There were 13 people in cell number 70 in the fort at that time. None of us ever knew the names of these prisoners because the commandant's office kept them strictly secret. They acted as grave diggers. The day before the execution, this commando would go out with shovels and pickaxes to dig holes and then go to fill them up. They also acted as grave diggers of those prisoners who were beheaded in Mizaka Street. I also managed to find out that the people from this commando were sentenced to death in advance, but they believed the Gestapo men's false statements that they would be released after a certain period of work. Indeed, every now and then, one or two would be released and the others would take their place. The new ones buried the supposedly released ones. That there were always 13 of them was just a gruesome Gestapo joke. The account of Marian Molesky imprisoned in Fort 7 from January to August 1941. The account of Helena Sarneka imprisoned in Fort 7 from May 1st, 1943 to November 9th, 1943. She was transported to Fort 7 and placed in a small one-person cell, cell number 73, adjacent to the cell for infectious ill men. Separate doors from a small corridor led to both of these rooms. There was no window to the world, but there was an opening in the wall separating the two cells. In the so-called the Krankenzell, were prisoners suffering from typhus, scarlet fever, conjunctivitis, etc. The caretakers put buckets of food next to the toilets for them in the dark. Prisoners with bad eyes often took stool instead of food. For three weeks she spent in this cell. She slept on a bench without a blanket, did not wash, and in addition, had to defend her slice of bread from rats. And though there's no memorial plaque besides these flowers and candle here, this could be what was once called the stairway of death. Just because it looks very similar to it, a large staircase and then off to the side, there's a um, cross there in the center. And it was called the stairway of death because... German soldiers would have prisoners run up a large staircase such as this one and they would have the prisoner carry a large stone and then once they got to the top of the staircase there would be another soldier at the top who would kick the prisoner down the stairs and many prisoners died that way and thus it got his name the uh, stairway of death. And there's still more to Fort 7 and pretty much each one of these bunkers or caves holds some sort of gruesome, terrible tale. And speaking about tales, that might be a uh, coyote up there on top of that hill. Probably the first good thing I've seen all day. Anyhow, I'm now looking for bunker number 17, which was where the uh, Germans, when they opened Fort 7, they uh, first killed a large group of uh, psychiatric patients from nearby hospitals. And they basically just gassed 400 people in a rather short period of time. And though a lot of these um, bunkers here, they don't have information about them, I'm not sure what else something like this would be used for other than maybe to store ammunition or later on, looks almost like a crematorium. And they, they did do that here as well. And now on the upper level of Fort 7,
And if you do come here, something to keep in mind is quite a bit of the information is in Polish. Some of it has been translated to English, but there's still quite a bit that has not been and you just kind of have to go online to fill in the blanks. And some of these cells or rooms, they're not numbered. This just says gas chamber, former artillery gun shelter. So it was one of the gas chambers, not sure if it's the gas chamber that I'm looking for, but it is labeled as a gas chamber. And hopefully I won't, no one will close the door. I'll get stuck in this room. And that's all in Polish there, but here's some information. It's in English. It says the iron door was closed and gas was let in from the cylinder. After eight minutes, the prisoners were called. I myself was called twice to carry out and load the corpses into the car. I loaded about 50 corpses for the first time. Among other corpses of eight-year-old children, women, and the elderly. The second time, I didn't finish the load because I fainted from emotions. So this was, in fact, one of the gas chambers. And they have this little memorial area set up. Very gruesome room here. And see what the next bunker was for. Looks like the coyote took off. He was just sitting right up here. Anyhow, here's the next gruesome bunker slash basement. Let's see what this one, no information. And these inscriptions are all in Polish here. Then they also have this memorial. So at least one of those bunkers was used as a gas chamber. It's not clear about this one. And looks like we're just about to the end of the bunkers for up on top here. And then there's a couple more rooms, basement areas downstairs that we have not been to yet. And this looks like this might be the last one that they have open. And this bunker has no information about what it was once used for, though likely it wasn't very good. And then it has another one of these doors on this side too, and this looks rather sinister, like it was used as uh, some sort of a furnace. Whatever it was used for, it was likely pretty gruesome. And that looks like the end of the exhibits just up here on the uh, top level still but it looks like the original fort just continues on back here past this fence and uh, that goes on for quite some ways so this was a huge installation at one time now back on the ground floor and there's at least two more bunkers that i haven't been to yet 19 and then one across the way there and i say at least two because once you get inside of these there's tunnels that go further back but most of them are closed off and let's see what this one has in store see these tunnels that just branch off this one is open but it looks like the main part of it was down this way here check out this side first 
kind of dungeon stuff that he got. And that's all dark in there. Looks like some stairs goes down further. And then they got this room here. And then here's some information. It says cell 58. The account of Stefan Quartz imprisoned in Fort 7 in the second half of 1941. However, after a dozen or so days, I was transferred to one of the larger cells of Fort 7, which already held 150 prisoners. And cell 58, that's this one right here. So 150 people. There were no windows in the cell, no toilet, and no water. Only some of the prisoners had enough straw. The rest slept on the bare floor. So they had 150 people just in this one room right here. And that is rather difficult to uh, picture 150 people in a room of this size, which is just slightly bigger than uh, some of those other uh, cells that, that we just saw. And then they have these exhibits and uh, let's see what they have here. They have some photographs of the people who are prisoners. And then it says a bill for the funeral of Franzek Bignitsky issued to the issued in the prison and then the same forensic they have his death certificate so they don't have the picture of forensic but uh, they did issue a bill for his death here at the prison and see a rosary made by some a prisoner And here's a female prisoner. Irina Babowska was executed in the prison in Berlin on September 25th, 1942. So they also had female prisoners here as well. And here's some uh, an arrest warrant for Sazla Klikowska, and that looks to be a German written arrest warrant. And then this gruesome looking contraption here, it says remains of the equipment from the cell of death. And that, that looks uh, rather scary there. They had it set up. There's a picture of it in the back it looks like they had some sort of a table there with a circular pattern cut out possibly to put someone's neck into that 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 would be just looking at that i'd i'd tell them whatever they want to know and here's some pictures of could be this prison or one of the concentration camps and Looks like they have dead bodies on one side and living prisoners on the other. And back to cell number 58, where this once housed up to 150 people. That is just really unreal that, that 150 people would be in a room of this size. Even if you did somehow survive, it's difficult to imagine that you would come out of this completely unscathed and they have all these little kind of passageways that it's not really clear what those were used for but anyhow see this is uh, more um, prisoner letters and somebody's student tram card there And then here's some uh, photographs of this prison or other concentration camps. And once you're in that situation, I, I guess it's pretty much over. Very gruesome pictures. 
And here, those look like prisoners doing slave labor. Looks like they're working on a railroad. And a lot more uh, dead bodies, basically. And this case here, it has uh, some prisoner bracelets. Also, it's like these are a certificate of issued by the Allies after liberation of the camp in Mahuzen Guzen. So uh, the people that did survive, the it's like they were given some sort of ID card that they were in fact a prisoner at one time. And sorry if I didn't pronounce that other concentration camp correctly. And these are photos of some of the prisoners. And more gruesome photos here of starving children. And other prison related photos. It doesn't say whether these were here. No, that, that looks like a different camp completely. These, these are from all kinds of different concentration camps. And anyhow, here's um, a prisoner's hat and work clothing. And then here's some playing cards that were made by the prisoners. And here's some more postcards. There's a postcard from one of the prisoners. And these are letters from various prisoners. And then here's one of the, a prisoner's address from the concentration camp at Revensbrück. More gruesome photos and another prisoner uniform. A picture depicting torture of prisoners in the camp at Daucha. And they all look rather gruesome. And here's some more prisoners clothing. A striped shirt from the camp in Le Moriz. And this looks interesting. This is a wooden shoe from the camp in Auschwitz. So somebody took the time to carve this shoe out of wood. That is very interesting. And these are some of the pictures of the prisoners who are here. And more prisoner pictures. And still wondering what's down these stairs here. I'm sure more gruesome tales of torture and killing people. And then this passage here, not sure where this goes to, but there's a lot of interesting looking photographs on the sides of these walls here. Let's see what these are. These are, these are a Fort 7. And this is in Polish, but 
This picture's got some burn marks there. This is in Polish, but that looks like a uh, crematorium. And then there's some sort of a... I don't know what, looks like we got some crates or something out front of that. And these pictures might have been before this uh, fort became a museum. I guess it was just kind of left um, abandoned. And then, see like here, there's a junk car just sitting out there. So at one time, I, it, it wasn't very well taken care of. And then now it's, it's actually pretty well taken care of now. Everything so far has been very clean. And, and I'm now back outside and off to the next bunker slash death chamber which is bunker number 11 here so the sign says pointing the way and they also have a nice flower memorial here very thoughtful and it looks like this one is locked so that apparently will conclude my tour of fort 7. hello everyone Today I'm in Poznan, Poland, and I came across this rather interesting historic building. And this is a Jewish synagogue, which is in rather poor condition. The ground floor entrance is boarded up, and it also has uh, several broken windows, and overall just not in a uh, very good condition. But it does have a very interesting history to it and this is the new synagogue of Poznan which was built in 1907 for the city's once thriving Jewish community and at that point in time this part of Poland was actually part of Germany and then Germany would go on to lose its Polish territories following the First World War and then during the Second World War, Poland was invaded once again. And it's really rather bizarre what they did with this uh, synagogue. They, the German troops turned it into a recreation center and they did that by pretty much removing everything that was uh, church related inside of the building and then installing a large indoor swimming pool and it was used as a rec center during the second world war and then after the war when poland was occupied by the soviets the city of poznan continued to use the uh, building as a recreation center right up until the 1990s and then at some point over the years it fell into disrepair and this is just a side view of uh, the synagogue and as you can see it's a rather large building it stretches just about this entire block right here and uh, so at some point the um, building became vacant and abandoned and then in 2002 the city of Poznan donated the property to a Jewish nonprofit, which supposedly had plans to renovate the synagogue. However, that was over 20 years ago, and apparently not much has become of those plans. And now, from what people who live here say, is the building has been sold to a developer who has plans to build one more apartment building here and that seems like that would be um, such a waste and also a great loss to history if this building were torn down just to build one more apartment and especially considering what happened to the people who uh, attended and built this church those people aren't coming back 
Most of them were, were killed, the, the, the millions of Jewish people who died during the Holocaust. And it just seems like um, it would be a, a great loss to history to tear a building like this down. And just to give you an idea of what's in this area here, um, right next to the synagogue, there's a newer apartment building. But then across the street from that, this building here looks like uh, the ground floor. Most of the stores are boarded up. And then the upper levels, they don't appear to be in use. So there's um, kind of other buildings that they can tear down in this area. And then across the street, this is the same story. Mix of older and newer buildings. And it would just be such a uh, great loss to history and society as well if they uh, tear this building down just to build one more apartment building. And I encourage everyone who watches this YouTube video to contact the city of Poznan and let them know what a terrible idea that would be and a uh, loss to history as well.